Okay. Thank, thank, thank you very much for the introduction. As mentioned, I'm uh, Daniel Preskill, uh, senior partner to a telecom specialized law firm and proud judge of the uh, Capacity Awards, which were, again, hugely uh, interesting and successful yesterday for those who attended and indeed uh, were nominated and are ultimately victorious. So, I've presented and moderated quite a few panels over the years at Capacity, but I consider that this is the most uh, serious one. Not because the other ones were trivial, but this is the first one where I think we are dealing with matters which are life or death on, and general carnage on a major scale. As the world moves to connected and smart cities, uh, hospitals, operations, everything is going to rely on network connectivity. We are exposing ourselves um, to major issues if we don't get our security right. We heard earlier in capacity that um, in relation to general telecoms fraud, the industry is doing better. We're down to about 1%, apparently a mere 15 billion a year, which we uh, apparently are, are losing to fraud. But the fraud of that scale is generally you know, individuals, small ent entities, sometimes terrorist organizations, uh, you know, hacking into networks for financial gain. But today we're really looking to discuss the threats in, in terms of the network and ensuring that um, we're not open to carnage on the major scale. And rather than dealing with individual people trying to get financial gain, we could be up against hostile states, very sophisticated cyber armies. And we are talking about private companies potentially up against major sophisticated cyber armies. And that's why I'm very pleased to have this uh, very distinguished uh, panel, which will hopefully help put us at ease. So um, I, I guess you know, one of the first um, questions I'd like to ask Anand is really, to, to what extent um, do you see the companies in our industry needing to cooperate and maybe take um, initiatives, you know, on a governmental and an international basis? Well, maybe That's just something. to start on that is, yeah. um, I mean, we're, we are in the industry now since 18 years, since 14 years, and, in, and we grew up in the area of OSSP assist solutions, and we're having around 120 carriers from very small to very big. Throughout this time, what we've experienced is that whenever you talk to someone, they say, yes, we do fight fraud. But the do five fraud, which we realized what the people had been doing over this time, it was just simply, here we have a report, we look on the figures and say, that's fraud, that's fraud, that's fraud. Yeah. Very sophisticated. <laughs> and, um, and even this year, I've been on a panel where actually a member of board of Orange said, look, we are a 40 billion company. Well, we don't care about that bit of fraud happening on our voice, traffic voice business. With this negligence, I mean, if I would have been the boss of this guy, yeah. after, that, after that presentation, I would have fired him. I mean, it's just simply unacceptable in this case. The point where we are right now is that technology advances, advances, advances. Fraudsters make best use of it, uh, while the industry itself, they now realize fraud just simply because, of, because their margin's going down. Now it's affecting them. In the past, it was just simply it, it, it really didn't affect them, but now it affects them, and now they have to get ahead of the process in order to achieve something. I think it's a very important point, and actually even more so. I mean, I've, I've seen some of the former PTTs uh, make margin on the fraud. Yes. I mean... Yeah, there's it, the other uh, point. I mean, very interesting. Uh, there's the other point. point. Trading fraud is like... Yeah. If you trade fraud, it's like trading stolen goods, trading drugs. I mean, the, the one who generates the drugs is the fraudster. The one who trades them is a dealer. In legal terms, if you understand that what you just trade is fraud, you have to stop this. There is no permission on that. And you're, made, and you're self committing a crime. That's also a thing which obviously is, which is not obvious in the industry. It also yeah. doesn't help yeah. that the credit card companies are essentially paying, covering the, for the fraud that does occur on their networks instead of trying to actively go and stop it. Mm -hmm. 
And that, uh, I think, has just been a huge concern for me when I, uh, I read a report that essentially said, if your credit card has already been compromised, your number is out on the, the dark web somewhere, you just haven't, it just hasn't been picked to be used. Mm -hmm. And if it does get used, your credit card company is not going to make any attempts to go and fight that. And so as a network operator, you, you know, we look at ourselves sitting in the middle of all this mess and think, how can we, you know, what, what steps can we take to go and block access to these kinds of things and, and try to prevent this from happening? So from us, it's, it's, a, it's a unique situation where we don't necessarily see it happening, but we know that it's crossing our network. So what can we do to try and stop that? And it's been, it's been a challenge for sure. And I'll, I'll just add to that. I mean, th we've seen over the last 20 years the change in what we consider fraud to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be that an operator was concerned about, you know, people stealing minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that that's, that's still relevant, but there's so much more scope in there now for, a, for a, an attacker to actually leverage, you know, where you are, your, your, I say access to uh, financial um, transactions, both on the, uh, from a carrier's perspective, but also down to the individual's perspective. The ability to um, assume someone else's identity is potentially there as well. So, you know, the, we're talking about a whole range of uh, sort of threats that now permeate from what was very simplistic, you know, there's fraud, there's fraud. And it's not just looking at it from a behavioral pattern change anymore in terms of somebody's activities. It's far more sophisticated than that. And um, are you dealing with any of the, uh, you know, national cybersecurity centers, obviously, in the UK, we've got the National Cybersecurity Centre, which I think, you know, on a national basis ha has helped a lot of these um, attacks on a sort of glo global basis rather than you know, individual fraudsters for in terms of the uh, attacks at the network security, which is just going to be so important going forward. And clearly, I don't know how you yeah. do that between operators who, say, so far haven't been that successful. Yeah. and just dealing with uh, individual fraudsters um, and reacting even to fraud. Sometimes it's, it's just yeah. shocking. Now you've really got to think ahead because we just don't have that margin yeah. for error. And, and again, their relationships will move to beyond like the, you know, the equivalent of the fraud squad type activities inside uh, legal uh, uh, business organizations such as the police. Um, it, it obviously relates to critical national infrastructure mm -hmm. as well. And, uh, um, I won't speak for any specific, specific operator, but you know, in general, the ones that we deal with have their own relationships with their, um, let's say, their, their countries of presence where they are, uh, their points of presence in terms of the, um, uh, the authorities in that instance, but also then the uh, specific security organizations at an European level and sometimes at a global level as well. It just depends. Um, if you're in the US, uh, obviously you'll be interacting with the likes of the FBI a little bit more than you would be if you're in Germany. But of yeah. course, uh, you know, that, that is also possible too. Yeah, and Lee, I mean, you're, Juniper, obviously, you know, your equipment systems are across the globe, presumably. Right? Sorry, say that again. You, I mean, presumably you're, you know, you're working across the globe, aren't you? Yes. On, on this. Yes. And, uh, and the same with and the, the, and the, and the industry, yeah. by the way, wouldn't work if yeah. there was no cooperation. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's, I've been involved in this, the security industry since 1989. Yeah. And I can tell you that it just wouldn't exist yeah. uh, without that inter form of interaction. Okay. I know I look younger than that, but, you know. Yeah. That's great. And, and I'd ask, ask um, sorry, D D Darren, we've got a question um, in. Uh, from the audience, uh, wh where would you see the biggest weakness in the industry when it comes to network security? That's a good question. Yeah, I really think that <clears throat> the biggest things that we're seeing now is the the large amounts of um, cloud providers that are uh, you know mm -hmm. spinning up uh, virtual machines for customers, IoT, home routers, uh, things like that, where you have people that are getting sophisticated machines, but they don't have the knowledge behind it to protect those machines. So uh, for instance, you can spin up a, a virtual machine for $10 a month in the US, and you get root access to this machine, and you essentially have no security background to secure it. And you know, not only that, you're installing software, but you're not installing updates. And so it really concerns me that we're giving this level of access without the oversight, um, or just the knowledge to say, you know, turn on automatic updates at the very least. Uh, which, you know, can be argued is, is wise or not. Yeah. But um, it's definitely coming down to uh, just these large number of devices that are being deployed uh, across the globe with essentially no security at all on them. 
It's interesting. I'm um, well. Helped set up one of the anti-fraud um, sessions, uh, work workshops at one of the U UK industry uh, associations, the FCS, and we were just literally working down, as you're saying, to get the installers and integrators to make sure that um, systems aren't installed with default passwords, zero, <laughs> zero, 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 and that, that's how it would be because yeah. they're just not paid the time to, to, to do that, and you know you've got that network vulnerability and. Uh, you know, if you start at that basic level. Well, away from, yeah. with regard to this question, yeah. I mean, fraud has different aspects. Actually, I mean, sections of fraud are just mm -hmm. like puzzles of a big picture, mm -hmm. let's say. And uh, the one thing which operators can control, if we're talking now about telecommunications traffic, is they can control the traffic coming in, mm -hmm. they can control the traffic generated and getting out. I mean, it's not about hacking into systems. It's no. not about opening connections. The thing which they can control is the traffic. And you know, uh, I've been on events where still this year, people are proud that they can react within four to six hours on fraud happening. But there are attacks running currently where, where fraudsters open something like 2,000 PBXs. It's not opening the PBX. PBX hacking actually is a misleading term. What they do is they hijack one device connected to the PBX. They only need to hijack this one, one device and inject traffic. It happened to us in December last year. We sitting on Deutsche Telekom network from Saturday morning, three o'clock until Monday morning, three o'clock, traffic of 13,000 euro went, was injected into our into our system entered into Deutsche Telekom's network. And yeah. you think of someone who is like Deutsche Telekom yeah. being extremely sophisticated in yeah. Germany, that should not happen. The operators simply do not commit. They simply do not tell the truth on things happening. And you know, we got an understanding as we are in, we got an understanding that such an attack looks like they open something like about 1,000, 2,000 PBXs silently over time. However they do that, that can be just simply by by sort of getting the information somehow. There's easy ways, there's people selling that information. And then once they have that, that one, then what they start, these people, is they start every night with 50 lines, you know? And then get the teams uh, sort of looking after these 50 lines. Yeah. Next night, 50 lines, next night, 50 lines. And we know of an operator who'd been using, let's say, market-leading fraud management solution, um, where also people were involved, and they had a response time of four hours. And during their worst months in, a year, in last, about last year, they lost 400,000 euros with this four hours response time. And so, so uh, it's simply, even if you think you're sophisticated, even if you think you have the stuff as process move on, mm -hmm. um, you have to get somehow ahead. And where we have to get to is, let's say, with regard to fraud, is to real-time live control of mm -hmm. the traffic and understanding of what's running in the network, and then you're able to, uh, to counter the threat. Yeah. If uh, I may, yeah. I just want, very quickly, uh, absolutely correct, and, and actually echoing what you were just talking about as well. And your previous speaker actually was referring to 5G uh, security models, but it's, I put it down to one word, apathy, actually. There's too many assumptions that, that we make in the ecosystem that we build that the security is inherently there, yeah? or that I inherently trust something else. And um, we find, to the point you were just describing, it's not that the fact that the, 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 the traffic that, that's then coming from those switches and circuits is assumed to be good, and so it's allowed, yeah. because, it, because the, an entry point enabled that to happen. So this is just a simplistic example of the fact that we have too much apathy and uh, assumptions around the way that we've actually implied uh, or applied security across the infrastructure that we build. And just to piggyback on that too, we're also in an environment too where you know open access to the internet <laughs> and free flow of traffic is occurring. Um, I was talking with uh, guys from Deutsche Telekom yesterday mm -hmm. and they said that in Germany they can't block DDoS traffic unless it affects their network or unless a customer requests it. So they can see this traffic crossing their network and they essentially can't do anything about it. And uh, can't uh, and, be, and, uh, can't or, or don't feel like it, or well, apathy. From, from what they said was yeah. based on German law. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. But I'm not up on German law, so. It's, it's, a, it's an excuse you can use right. if you're not able to handle it. There, there is ways how to control stuff. I mean, I, yeah. one of the things that I, as yeah. being in the carrier space and being in that, you know, the, the tier one market, we hear a lot that the tier ones need to do this and you need to do this and you need yeah. to do this. But what I'm not hearing is the price of IP going up. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of you know investment that goes into protecting our networks, and customers want to have cleaner networks, clean pipes, and things like that, but they don't want to pay for it. And we look the, so. what, what my I mean what I said, and, and uh, one of the biggest things I mean obviously is the move to IP SIP IP, but the move to SIP IP opened Pandora's box with regard to fraud. Because SIP IP yeah. is not a proprietary yeah. network, it's not SS7. Yeah. On, in, in older times, you required someone within telecoms industry to commit serious fraud. Now everybody can commit fraud and, 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 mm -hmm. and can go for it. And there's, I've downloaded something to do it. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that's, actually, that's actually the thing. And if you compare the internet with a PC, on each PC we have an anti antivirus system. These antivirus systems go into memory now checking that stuff. Mm. And we have to have something similar within, within the cloud, within the world, in order to control SIP IP. And that's where we have to go to. And, and what's the thing? You know, when you think about what's happening in terms of the devices that come onto the internet, and the, the open internet is a great way of describing it. You know, uh, today, we've grown up in, the, in the, over the last 20 years that the thing that was the most prevalent entity on the internet was a PC with a squidgy piece of wetware us, on the other end of it, which was the, the, the thing that gave input and waited for output. That's changing. Already we're in the point where there's six or seven billion devices connected to the internet, so more than people every day. And within the next sort of 10 years, the forecasts are hey, 20, 30, 50 billion. So how on earth do we provide that level of protection for those devices and not stifle innovation at the same time? It's very difficult to understand exactly what's going to go on through that connection that somebody's enabled to happen. And that's, that's potentially uh, a disruption for uh, the whole industry to think about. How does a, um, a benign uh, uh, manufacturer of, I don't know, water pumps ensure that he's not involved in a critical national infrastructure attack? because yeah. of the way that that software has been developed and coded. There's too many assumptions in the way that we anticipate that technology is going to be used for the purpose that we intended it for. And it's that that... Uh, so I really like the analogies that were being used in the previous presentation. Yeah. There's also one thing right now running around like this artificial intelligence machine learning. <laughs> we are into that as well, but this artificial machine learning is only a segment, only a small piece, and it's only about the detection. But detection... <laughs> How do you get from detection to protection? There is much, much more involved, and it's only a piece. And this machine learning, I mean, it simply helps systems to understand what we see, like, like that's the wall. How do I know that's a wall, that's a roof? How do I know that's a chair or something like that? That's what machine learning and artificial intelligence is doing only. But it doesn't give you any processes. It doesn't give you mm. any ideas, any understanding on how to stop that, something. So there is more involved on intelligence than just simply this term. And it doesn't help at all. So what, you, what we have to get to now is we have to get to a point where we understand live, that's good, that's bad traffic. Good example, there is a fairy tale, I mean Cinderella and her pigeons picking out the good and the bad ones while the good ones can continue to run. Coming to that state is where we have to get to. And that's where all that security stuff has to move to. It's not about hackers hacking into something, because they only hack into something if they can, if they can profit off something. Mm -hmm. And why should they go a hard way when they can go the easy way just to make an awesome amount of money? I mean. You know, uh, absolutely. One thing, I mean, in your example, Deutsche Telekom, and maybe we should be a bit more uh, general here, I mean, presumably that traffic, do they invoice? Ah, you or no, what, one they're, press kid. They're on I this see. story, within yeah. the EU, it's regulated that actually the network operators who offer mm. services to companies have to cover the costs on such damages. But they write you, they, they write you an invoice. Then they mm. say, you don't have to pay this, but this, this invoice stands. And they write you a nice, decent letter. Within these sentences, you can read. So if, 
you can read of that, if this is going to happen again with you, we might come back to you. Mm -hmm. It's not said there, but mm -hmm. it's written there in this case. Yeah. And you as company, you don't feel good. Yeah. Um, well, that actually moved us to something, and we are going to come up with something which will, which will help or which will protect enterprises, corporates, live against such things. Uh, but up to the time, you cannot be secure on that. You're not mm. secure. You're not secure. You feel bad, and um, and it can happen again. And within Europe, there is this thing that, by law, actually every operator is to uh, protect their networks, and they don't raise any any fees for that. Mm. And if something's upcoming, then the, then the commercial teams say, yeah, but you know, we can't commercialize that, so we better don't do it. You know, it's so there is it's a bit it's a bit weird stuff. And for example, just on Deutsche Telekom, I've been on an event, they have a team of 300 <coughs> people with just 300 people within their fraud department for communications mm. and systems. And, and there's a lot of manual stuff involved, but how come that something like that happens in December 2017, mm. two days of fraud running to, Af running to Africa and some dodgy British yeah. islands? I mean, yeah. Well, we're, yeah, we're, the, the threats are so varied in, in many different ways, and, and one of the things that we're, and to talking specifically about, you're right, the language of AI is just too encompassing, it's too broad a subject to sort of say, well, we can rely on AI. So one of the things that we're looking at is, uh, and taking some uh, feedback from customers in, over the last year and a half, we've been looking at, well, what's happened wrong, what's failed in the industry? A lot of organizations and enterprises have adopted a SIM. Right, security information event management tool as a way of trying to understand and interpret what's happening across their business from a threat perspective. Well, the reality is they're being over flooded and consumed by noise and uh, separating the, 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 the noise from actually the things that matter has become very difficult for them. So one of the things that we can do here is actually use machine learning to help identify and see patterns in that behavior rather than the general noise. Yeah. So that's a step towards that. Yes. And one of the things that we're talking around, instead of using that language that is an information management system, is threat, at an, threat analytics platforms. So I anticipate that that, and um, SOAR is another acronym that's yeah. arriving, around the analytics, mm -hmm. specifically associated with telemetry and indicators of compromise, that we're seeing from all manner of devices across an infrastructure. And then it's to enable an organization to potentially start to look at that and say, well, yes, that is good and bad. And then watch what the human does. Because a machine doesn't know yeah. whether or not that's good or bad behavior instinctively on its own. Yeah. It doesn't see consequence in the same way that a human does. Mm. But we can. So let's start and actually watch what human behavior exhibit is exhibited based on the telemetry that we gave the human in that situation. Mm -hmm. So then we can start to make predictions potentially in the future of what to do when this telemetry comes in. And that's what we're likely to see in the next few years. Not, AI is just, I'm sorry, is just a marketing term. So yeah, I mean, if we get, take it back to the sort of machine learning yeah. uh, terminology, I mean, clearly some of these cyber armies of, um, say, hostile regimes, yeah. they're going to have machine learning as well. Yeah. So it's just going to be a, it's going to be a race, cat arms race, cat, yeah. cat, cat, cat and mouse. Yeah. But uh, I think the important thing is to make sure that uh, the industry, you know, we, we are on our toes. And you know, the, the always... apathy so far on the fraud, and I say when you see just such basic fraud still happening yeah. in 2018, it's, it's, it's really quite yeah. uh, it's alarming. It's basic fraud. I mean, it's, it's fraud which is, which is ongoing. It's... Yeah. Um, because we got reports of, of things like that happening on all continents, and and <laughs> and you know, and then operators that say they they put it to the PBS providers, they say, well, it's not our thing, we can it's all secure and all that. It's it's just simply because it's not only hacking. Someone only needs to hand over a connection to a device, yeah. and there are areas in the world where people just simply do that do for that. some hundred bucks, and and then they collect these devices. They have access to a thousand systems. We see, for example, we know in Africa where simboxing had been an issue. They close simboxing. What's happening? The traffic is injected via PB access, yeah. just on the same level. Yeah. So, and it's just simply so. So, there. The point is with that stuff. Um, moving to SIP IP, moving to SIP IP on PB access. I mean that extended 
that it extended the gate of injection of traffic and injection of fraud to companies out of the reach of operators in this case. But even if they would be in the reach of the operators, they could not control what single persons would be doing in this case. So the thing, how, what, you, what should or what has to be introduced is, let's say, maybe an additional level which is able with uh, profiling, which is able with, uh, with um, understanding of the traffic to say, okay, that's a good call, that's a bad call. Just simply, uh, that has to be introduced in a way that it doesn't affect the calling and that it really sort of stops the leak, let's say, or the hole in this case. And, um, and the example given, that was just one example, but I know of other major operators in Europe which have been affected seriously by that type of fraud. Well, I think, I think the, the point is, is that if the, if the basics aren't, work, aren't, aren't working anymore, they're not simple. It's because they're not simple to achieve anymore. So therefore, the word basic, it doesn't apply. If the basics of security aren't simple, then they're no longer basics. They've, we've, 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 we've made ourselves too focused in one area to focus on actually really what the, the threat is. And we haven't looked at that in that concept. In that, Perspective. We've looked at it for the last 20 years about protecting Wintel devices from running, you know, scripts that basically people shouldn't do. The, the nature of the device and the, and the way that someone can get the connectivity in via a device to, on an IP uh, environment to do something else is just too easy. So we've 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 got to shift our mentality around thinking where the security models need to be applied. Yes. The basics have changed. And how do we get that cooperation, do you think? Because, you know, if you're providing the network operator, and as you say, all these bits of hardware uh, for the uh, 5G IoT world are being connected in, whether it's smart cars, smart buses, you know, the, the 5G cell sites, presumably there's got to be some form of cooperation from the network to understand, to make sure that there's some security yeah. in there. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just wondering how the industry goes around making sure you've got that dialogue because, you know, for the operator, there's traffic coming and hacked. You may not get paid for that. And it may be your uh, underlying carrier will invoice you plus the carnage that could result. You know, the, the, re the, the effort that they take to secure devices, I think, really depends, too, on how, what, what kind of devices, how important yeah. is it. The, Nest thermostat in my home or the camera that's looking over my, my door, you know, is going to need a lot less security than a car that's automated and driving autonomously on the street. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of effort put into securing that, uh, you know, that, that vehicle versus the camera that's sitting next to my door. <coughs> and while from the security perspective, we want to say, no, you need to apply the same level of efforts in all areas, reality is, is that somebody is willing to pay quite a bit of money for this car that will drive itself because they see the value in that. But when they put a camera on their doorstep, they want to get the cheapest camera they can. And it comes down to you're not going to get great security in a $50 device that is being mass produced. Uh, and, and it could be the component itself within that camera, uh, you know, that's packed, that's wrapped around a very well-known brand, but you don't know where that actual camera part, you know, component came from. And that's the, that is the, the hole in that security. So your supply chain, is, uh, is compromised in that manner. Yeah, and presumably uh, for the manufacturers, they don't necessarily know in which country uh, the device is going to be right. used and then which network it's going to be, right. to be in. So, I mean, you know, how are you going to I mean, deal back, with that? With standards I mean, or national, national standards, what, cyber standards? What we just, what just referred to, that's, that's the reality. That's the re mm -hmm. reality in life. And uh, uh, the one thing which I think, which which telecoms are not really aware of. They have, they have a turf, they have an area where they can intercept, ignoring all that bits and pieces, irrespective of whether they're 3G, 4G, 5G, or whatever. It's about the traffic. It's about the traffic. They have to fully understand what the traffic, whatever traffic, voice traffic, SMS traffic, yeah. data traffic, what that stuff is about, in a way to understand, OK, that's, that's OK. I don't need to bother about. That might be dangerous and should have maybe a lock, uh, look at, at that. Here's also the question how machine learning can, if that could be a valid method to detect attacks. Of course, machine, well, machine learning is a valid method. I mean, we, ha we run currently a, uh, a project with a German university for one and a half year. It's German funded, mm -hmm. that stuff. 
But this machine learning stuff, it's sort of a, a way. Machine learning can only happen and is only successful once you have specialists learning the system, mm -hmm. learning the system and algorithm so that the system is going to uh, decide then in this case. And so you look on historical data and on this basis, this thing learns because of machine learning and then you can adopt this. So actually, once you have the result, it's rather inflexible, but it's just simply something like an algorithm uh, which helps to understand stuff. Yeah. So, and, uh, so you have to get that, and you have to get this to a place where you get the information as fast as possible. Not yeah. six hours later, not 12 hours later, or 24 hours later. Six seconds later. Yeah, yeah it, should be, it should be within milliseconds, the information yeah. there. I think well, you've got a number of challenges that, uh, that get in your way as well. You've got things like TLF 1.3, that is, you know, um, a, a standard essentially that helps us on a personal level with our sort of confidentiality of the information being sent across packets, but actually presents a number of challenges for different organisations along the way of moving those those packets in terms of are they safe? So what what we, can we see inside it is starting to change as well. Oh, absolutely. And you know, uh, not just an encryption, but encoding in terms of what what an application is doing is very difficult for you know, third parties and security vendors alike to understand and interpret and keep on top of. Essentially, we have to move our model from what I call a time-based security model, where we've enabled the, the, the bad guys, if you will, to weaponize time. They, they've, they've able to leverage the use of time on their side so that the industry has to provide a form of an update somewhere to provide a protection layer somewhere to protect against it, that of course needs testing as well. Now, if we shift the mentality to a behavioral system, then that behavioral system has to have other caveats and rules around it that would, for example, say, well, I've not seen this application before. Do I block applications? No, not by default, because I've not known them, but maybe I might want to restrict it from accessing these parts of the data center, or these parts of the internet, or these parts of my infrastructure. Or, or so on. And then once you know, you've had a sort of uh, pattern being built up of the activity around that, then you may open that up via rules to something else. But we've just got to shift our mentality from that time-based to a behavioral-based system, 100%. And, and do you think um, you know, the, the industry should be pushing governments for extra funding for R&D because effectively you know, national infrastructure, critical national infrastructure, society is just going to be run. I mean, just all business, everything connected to the cloud, I mean, is going to be dependent on network security. So the, the importance of R&D funding cooperation, actually one of my clients does the IT security for the government 6.6. .6. They also thinking it would be good to have maybe some accredited cyber labs which will test networks, you know, on behalf of the public authorities so that they will test and expose vulnerabilities and then the regulator can approach a, say, Deutsche Telekom uh, and say, look, our, our cyber labs have detected X, Y, and Z vulnerability. I mean, I'm, I'm just really looking what we can do as yeah. an industry. Maybe, maybe I can give an yeah. example on that. We have this GDPR thing now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. This GDPR thing. We have that, I just talked, said about this study with this German university. We have about 30 customers using our anti-fraud system. We have that study running with this machine learning AI. Now, up to that, for, we, we require data in order to verify that the machine learning is working. Since we have GDPR in place, there's only one company we're getting data from, and that's an Israeli company. <laughs> now, all the others just simply say, no, we cannot provide any more any data, and, uh, and that's where we go. And this, this project is government funded. So, um, uh, government funding doesn't necessarily help in this case. It'll, it'll slow down processes, I mean, very much, because you have to be in line with rules and all that. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, the industry is at a point where the industry itself has to uh, simply change their thinking. It has to move, from, it has to, move to be behavioral protection. And uh, we have to get away from our thinking that if we close our home, everything is secure. That's not the case. No. And we have to build the system as well so that it can tolerate smaller shocks rather than big ones. And I'll give you a very simplistic analogy of this. A, a, a police officer on the street 
does not walk around with uh, all of the world's criminals in his back, name, the names and the identities of the criminals in their back pocket. That's what we're asking security technology to do today. Whereas instead, what we should be doing is doing what the police officer actually does, which is watch behavior. And it, once that behavior is observed, then of course intercept and try to do something about it. But trying to build a system that would try and identify all unknown, unseen at levels of activity before is just, that's a ridiculous notion as well. So you have to build a system that would enable some form of you know, patient zero in that sense, but then limit it to patient zero and one. Because, because otherwise we'll, we'll forever be in this cycle of, that we're in today where we're requiring, an, requiring a, a signature of an update of some kind that, that, that stops it. And that's just proven over the last 20 years not to work. And it will be a system learning by itself, Correct. Think, as the nature of the yeah. system itself. Yeah. It not, it's not machine learning AI, but it will be intelligent itself, I yeah. mean, and it will be learning and, and, and work. If I may, I'm going to give you an analogy, right? Uh, we're all, we all know when we catch a cold, right? I'm not feeling brilliant at the minute, I'm, I'm, over, I'm getting over it, by the way, so don't, I'm, not, I'm actually infectious at home. Um, but we know when we, our body gives us telemetry signals that indicate that we're not feeling very well, right? We get hot, we get clammy, we might feel tired, lethargic, have a headache, a bit sore. This is information that the body and your brain interprets as you not feeling brilliant and probably not very well. Now, your business actually gives you that same information in a digital form. We have, there are many digital fingerprints, if you will, inside a business that can help indicate whether or not the business is operating as normal. And a shifting of a behavior from one that listens, because that's what we've not done so thus far, really. Listen to that telemetry actually makes sense. And I think we're not, we're not going to get there tomorrow. It's going to take time, and it will be refined. But the time and effort, I believe, that we spend on building a more accurate picture of behavior and what's normal is infinitely more time rewarding than the model that we do today because every month we throw away the work we did last month because <laughs> it needs to change. Right. That's great. And in, in terms of, um, you know, for, for critical national infrastructure, smart cities, do you think the operators will be able to, a little bit like VPNs, you know, have some secure networks for specific types of services where they can actually compartmentalize to make sure, and, and it's also to guarantee the throughput and everything, or is that just wishful thinking? I think it's an option, yeah. but whether or not it will gain market acceptance is another matter. Um, there will always be caveats and resistance to those types of movement. You know, an open internet isn't possible when yeah. you start to provide different types of swim lanes in that sense. Yeah. So there are a number of different things that can be done. Which one will win out in the end is, frankly, an, uh, open for debate. It also depends on where you place that. Yeah. In the core, of the core of the internet, it's not going to work. No. No. It's got to be pushed out to the edge. Sure. And you know, who's responsible for that edge? Is it, is it the customer's responsibility? Is it the carrier's responsibility? Well, as a carrier, I don't want to be the one who, who picks winners and losers when it comes to your traffic. You send me traffic, you want traffic, and I want to pass that along. Mm. And it's not, you know, it's not my determination to say, well, okay, yeah, I, I see based on uh, the behavior of this IP address that it typically does these things, but that suddenly that behavior changes. But that's not for me to know because, especially with encryption being what it is, yeah. I, don't look, well, I don't look at those inside those packets anyway. <laughs> I know, you know, a very basic amount of what, what that traffic is doing. And it's not my, it's quite frankly none of my business what's in those packets. That's, you know, just my job is you've contracted me to just pass this traffic. And so it becomes a situation of, it gets sticky in that situation. Yes, we're in a position where we see all this traffic, but are we, are we the right ones to do something about it? And I don't think that that's, that's necessarily true. Well, I mean, yes, I think there are means. There are means, there are, there are things there right now. Uh, and it is possible to get something where you can get to life protection, but Let's say I'm, we are going to publish something very shortly, um, but I'm not here to advertise yeah. that. Um, I think in, even in SIP IP, we are able to control, to control any SIP IP communication live, uh, and we are able to extend uh, the level of protection 
into all areas of the network uh, in this case. But that requires all knowledge, all know-how, mm -hmm. and it requires an understanding. And, um, and if the means which are there for the fraudsters to commit fraud, these are the same means which we can use to overcome that fraud. Mm -hmm. But you only need some, you simply need some clever guys, as clever as the fraudsters. And um, um, I've recently, about a year, a year ago, I talked to one of these guys from this one other segment. And these guys, whenever they realize something is infringing their attempts, then they really look at, at every level of detail to prevent that, because also they, their operations are also on their side sort of costed. But, but, they are, but they are then, they are then looking at levels of detail which are on the bit, down to, to, to the bits, bytes and bits and that level. And we on our side, we have to get onto this area, into this section as well. And only once we are, once we are there at that point, we are able to provide systems uh, to overcome fraud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we've got maybe time for one question from the audience. I know we've had some on the system, but any, any questions? Okay. Okay, and then finally, is there, and I don't think it is, but is there kind of a buzzword for the, uh, you know, new potential systems which is going to Enhance, obviously, we we're talking about machine learning, but I, I don't come, haven't come across. Uh, we will, we will you know, offer anything that's really going well, to say this uh, is going to be the solution. We will, we will offer something shortly, which okay. we, which you could name life zip protection, mm -hmm. yeah. and it'll overcome it'll overcome uh, uh, network legacy issues, and it's like uh, the protection will be on a way that if that is sort of the, the signaling of a call, my arm here. Yeah then the protection will be in a way that we then go on here with the other hand, call start, call end, and we are able to drop the call. And then on that side, we have all the evaluation of, uh, of high-end systems mm -hmm. doing what all, what's been done at operator level, just with every single call. And then this way, with behavioral analytics, we are able to understand, okay, that's good, that's bad. That will be upcoming. We are currently just simply working on administrative stuff to get that out to an audience of several million customers. Okay. Well, we're looking at um, doing a lot of analytics uh, on IP addresses and things like that um, with some of our partner companies at NCT. So we are looking at that behavior analytics uh, to see if we can determine, um, essentially try to predict DDoS. Mm -hmm. And so there's quite a few things that we're doing in that space to look at that to try and and figure out if this is going to, you know, something that we can do. Uh, and it's, it's been uh, successful so far in our lab test. So uh, we're definitely looking forward to, uh, you know, using uh, really the data that we have to try to, to push forward these new technologies. Yeah, and in final sense, I mean, um, the, the industry will start to use terminology very much like what you just heard. Behavior analytics makes much more sense than AI. It's just too grandiose. Um, so be careful of snake oil charmers, right? But, but uh, yeah, machine learning for sure. I mean, we're using, a, we're developing a threat analytics platform. So rather than falling into the threat, the, the, the world of, of the sim that we've we found doesn't actually work in all instances, where it's a bit like, you know, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. You have to know what the question is that you're asking, and whether or not it's a meaningful question uh, to get a, a sensible answer out of it. It's helping uh, administrators and security teams identify unusual activity and then give them some form of guidance over, well, do this or do that in terms of response, and, and then monitoring what they do. And over the period of time from once we use that, actually starting to be able to then, as a future step from there, give them those controls as an automated option. But we're not going to get to that full layer of automation yet until people have learned to trust the system 98% plus of the time. You know, we're just not going to get there yet. And, and that's an important thing, too. You know, as, as a carrier, we do rely on our vendors. Uh, and so it, it's partnering with our vendors to look for those, you know, those technologies that we need to do, let them know what our concerns are, where do we need to build off of, and then you know, work with them, partner with them in those situations. Yeah. Right. Well, I think it's been very helpful, uh, very encouraging to see the uh, efforts 
um, your companies in particular and others are, are doing to uh, combat the threats. And as I mentioned, it's really one of the first sessions I've been involved moderating in, which is really a question of uh, preventing life and death and general carnage on a large scale. And uh, hopefully we can reduce some of the apathy amongst the uh, big operators, which yeah. is unfortunately st still, still there, as we saw effectively the, the fact that we're proud that it's only 15 billion in basic fraud that's uh, apparently lost to the industry uh, so far. Yeah. Um, so on that note, I think we'll uh, conclude it given the time, but we'll be around for a few minutes if anyone wants to uh, corner us afterwards. Thank you, Daniel, and to all our panellists. Thank you. Our next session today is the...